Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, sorry, 1 to 4, and then chapter 10, 11 to 14. Hebrews chapter 1. The supremacy of God's Son. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he, was, he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And then we turn over to chapter 10, verse 11 to 14. And every, piece, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Just so far in the world we're reading. Thank you. Please sit down. Shall I pray for us? Heaven, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God Almighty and that your most awesome work was done in the frailty of your Son. Thank you that we have your Bible before us, inspired by you, your word to us this morning. And we do pray that as your word is preached, that it would be accompanied by the Holy Spirit and power and deep conviction and that we wouldn't hear the words of a man, but indeed the voice of God, as the scripture is explained. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for our good. Amen. Amen. Uh, Joel Beakey is the speaker at Goodwood Baptist Church on the, uh, the 12th of January, uh, that, uh, on the, uh, for the evening service, half past six. He's one of the speakers at the Grace Ministers' Conference, uh, every January I try and go on the Grace Ministers Conference. It's organised by uh, the Reformed Baptist Churches um, and it's a great start and uh, real encouragement for ministry for the year ahead. And they always have very good speakers. Joel Beakey is a Reformed, um, uh, Reformed Evangelical from the States and uh, be, it'll be well worth your time and effort and trouble to come to the Goodwood Baptist Church on that Sunday evening. An old man was on his deathbed and he wanted to be buried with his money. So he called his minister, his doctor and his lawyer to his bedside. He has 300,000 rand cash to be held by each of you, he said. I trust you to put uh, this in my coffin when I die so I can take all the money with me. At the funeral, each man put an envelope in the coffin. Riding in a limousine after the funeral, the minister suddenly broke down into tears and confessed and said, I only put 200,000 in the envelope because I needed 100,000 to repair the roof of the church. Well, since, said the doctor, since you're confessing and we're confiding in each other, I only put down 100,000 rand in the envelope because we needed a new x-ray machine in our pediatrics ward. The lawyer was aghast at the other two. I'm ashamed of you both, he said. I want it to be known that when I put my envelope in the coffin, I enclosed a check for the full amount. <laughs> now, the minister and the doctor were plagued by their conscience, by their guilty conscience. They had known that they had done wrong and they wanted to confess it. And we know that people who have done wrong things uh, in life are troubled for many, many years and sometimes 20 years after the crime they go and confess it uh, at the police station. And it's true to say that all people have a conscience and we, when we do wrong it bothers us. Instinctively we know that we have sinned 
although not many people will call it sin. Yet, as the Bible teaches us, some people's consciences have been seared by their constant violation of their consciences. And so they keep on doing the wrong thing despite their conscience. And the Bible says our consciences can be seared and hardened. And then when we do wrong, we are no longer troubled or bothered by it. But most people in our world today have a sense of right and wrong, a sense of God, and a sense that somehow uh, there is a God and we have failed to live up to his expectations and standards for us. And this sense, this innate instinctive sense we have of God and right and wrong, and that we have somehow failed him in some way, this innate sense comes because we are all created in the image of God. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 and 2 tells us that God created a good world and he created human beings to live in the world under his authority. And then he, create, and he created human beings in his image to have something of him in human beings. And so instinctively we have a sense of right and wrong and that there is a God and that we are not God and we ought to worship uh, this higher being. Sadly, in Genesis chapter 3, human beings rebelled against God. We were cast out, of the Ed- cast out of the Garden of Eden. Physical and spiritual death entered our world. And uh, we now live under the judgment of God. And the world is under the judgment of God. We live in a fallen world with earthquakes and diseases and cancer. But yet, we still, rem- we still are created in the image of God. And something of the image of God is still in us. And so we see in our world that there is a sense that there is a God and that there is right and wrong and that we have fallen and uh, sinned in some way although people will not call it sin. So most people acknowledge that there is some kind of God and that we fall short of his standards. And there is an almost universal acknowledgement that we need to make up for our failures in some way. Now they won't... um, Point, they won't take the biblical route, but in some way people try and make up for their failures in life. And people do it in various ways. Some people do it by their good deeds, or try and do it by their good deeds. They think somehow that in the larger scales of justice, if they've been very bad, if they, be, if they are very good and do a whole lot of good things, somehow on the last day the, the good deeds will outweigh the bad deeds. So they try and make up for their failures with good deeds. Um, some try and make up for their failures with charity and so they give money to, to the Red Cross or to churches or to um, disaster areas. And some I think that by giving, God will approve of them on that last day. Others try and make up for their failures by religious observances. So they, so they faithfully go to Mass, they faithfully attend church or have confession or say their Buddhist prayers in some kind of hope that God will find that religious observances um, favorable. Some people do it by comparison. And so they will say, yes, I might be bad, but I'm not that bad. I'm not a rapist, I'm not a murderer, I'm not a criminal. And so they compare, compare themselves with others. Although the Bible just says that in comparison with God, none of us make it. Or they keep the golden rule and treat others as they would like to be treated. Or what, they, what some people do is they simply create a God, a God of their own thinking who is not that serious about sin and is happy to overlook sin. But somehow people try and make up some kind of way, some kind of world view um, that excuses their failures that one day on the great day when they face God that they instinctively know that they will be acceptable to him. Now the Bible teaches us that our sin does indeed separate us from God, that is quite right, but we cannot make ourselves acceptable to God. There is no way that anything we can do, no amount of money we can pay, no amount of religious observances uh, we can perform that makes us acceptable to God for at least two reasons. One is that sin is more serious than we think. Sin is not something that can just be swept under the carpet. No, it is an affront to Almighty God. Our sin separates us from the God of heaven. Sin is serious. And also, God is more holy than we think. Yes, God is God of love and he's compassionate and kind and gracious, but he's also a just God who must punish sin. A just God who can't allow sin simply to ignore, he must punish it. And so we can't simply do something to make ourselves acceptable to God. So over the last few weeks, we've been looking at how the Old Testament prepares us for the coming of Jesus. And we've looked at various categories, like king and prophet, And today we're looking at the category of priest and how Jesus 
is our ultimate and final priest who makes us acceptable to God. Everyone in the world, in that sense, there, there is a God, unless we suppress that truth, and we know that we need to be acceptable to Him. And the Bible tells us how we can be acceptable to God. Now, you will know that a priest is someone who is authorized to mediate on behalf of people to God. Now, he's the, a priest is the opposite of prophet. A prophet goes to the people on behalf of God. A priest goes to God on behalf of the people. So a priest is a mediator, a go-between between people and God. And in the Old Testament, God instituted and established the role of priest to in fact prepare us for the coming for the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will know that the priesthood was established at Mount Sinai after God delivered the law to Moses. We know the story. God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt from the land of bondage. He brought them through the Red Sea and then gathered them at Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God gave them the law which included the Ten Commandments as to how they should live. That was the purpose of the law. That was how they should live as God's saved people. The law never saved anyone. They were already saved by the time they reached Mount Sinai. And now that they were saved, God said, There is my law, including the Ten Commandments, uh, which is a summary of the law, how you should live to please me. And so too for the Christian life. The law has never saved anyone, can't save us. But it shows us how to live in order to please and honor God. And after the Ten Commandments, God gives instructions for the sacrificial system, including the role of priest. Because God knows that Yah is my law, this is what you must do to please me. But God knows that his people cannot keep that law. They are fallen sinful beings. They cannot keep that law. And so he creates this system, the sacrificial system, that will somehow atone for their wrongs and misdoings. And indeed we shall see point us to Christ who ultimately saves us. And Yah is how it worked. If you're an Old Testament believer... When you did wrong or sinned or became unclean in some way, you took an unblemished lamb or goat, or if you were very poor, a dove, and you went to the priest at the temple. And the priest killed the animal and sprinkled its blood on the altar in front of the, the, in front of the temple. And there your sin was atoned for. It was covered. You see, you deserve death you, because of your sin. Sin deserves death. The wages of sin is death. But you went to the priest and instead of you dying for your sin, for your uncleanness, for your unworthiness, that goat died in your place. It was a picture. That lamb died in your place. That dove died in your place so that you could be free, so that your sin could be covered. That's what atoned means. So that your sin could be covered in some way. Or well, that only becomes clear in the New Testament. And all these sacrifices for sin and uncleanness, they all culminated on the great day of atonement that we read of in Leviticus chapter 16. Now on the day of atonement, the high priest, there was only one high priest, and he took three animals, a bull and two goats, and he killed the bull for his own sins, and then he went into the most holy place, that was the most holy place in the whole temple, it was there, it was behind the heavy curtain, that curtain which was torn when Jesus died. It was there that the holy place was with the, with the Ark of the Covenant. And there he would go in once a year, kill a bull for his own sins, and he would sprinkle the bull's blood on the Ark of the Covenant. He deserved to die, but the bull died in his place, and he prayed that God would accept that offering. And then he took the first goat, and he killed the goat for the sins of the people so that their sins could be covered and atoned for. And he sprinkled that blood on the Ark of the Covenant, on the mercy seat on top. And then, after that, the third goat uh, did not die, but the priest, the high priest put his hands on, on the goat's head, and he confessed all the sins of Israel onto the goat. And then he chased that goat into the wilderness to run away. And that Day of Atonement was a picture for us, and a picture for the believers back then, of the means and the result of atonement. What is the means of atonement? Well, the means is a substitutionary sacrifice. Something has to die so that you can be forgiven. Sin deserves death, so if you want to be covered, if you want to be forgiven, something must die. And that bull and that goat dies. But also it pictures for us the result of atonement. So what is the result of atonement? Well, our sins are carried far away, like that goat into the wilderness. Our sins 
are taken away. It's a picture, of course, of what the Lord Jesus Christ will do for us. But back then, priests made sacrifices for sin, and this continued for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and hundreds and hundreds of animals were killed, and hundreds and thousands of liters of blood flowed from before the altar. And then a baby boy called Jesus was born. He grows up into a man who says and does remarkable things. On one occasion, he came before a paralyzed man. He said to this man, your sins are forgiven, take your mat and go home. And he did. On another occasion, Jesus said, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And then Jesus goes to the cross. And there on the cross, as he's about to die, he says, it is finished. What did he mean? Well, the rest of the New Testament tells us that the great work of reconciling, God, reconciling man to God, the great priestly work, the great sacrifice of an unblemished lamb before God, the great work of making people acceptable to God is finished. So Jesus says, it is finished, it is done. So Jesus is our ultimate priest. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 says. You can look up in your Bibles, but these verses will also be on the screen. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says in Hebrews 2 verse 17, Therefore, Sorry, therefore he had to be made that he, therefore he that is Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect. In other words, Jesus became a human being so that he could pay the price for other human beings on the cross. Uh, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So there we have it. Jesus is our great high priest and he goes to the cross to make propitiation. Propitiation is a very important word in the Bible. It means the placating of wrath. It's a word that not many people like today. But God is filled with wrath and anger because of sin. He must punish sin. Yes, he's a loving God, but he must punish sin. And there on the cross, Jesus placates the very wrath of God by dying as a just punishment for sin for the sake of others. Our great high priest. Now why is Jesus our ultimate and final high priest? Let me give you a few reasons. Why is Jesus our ultimate and final high priest? Firstly, because Jesus sat down. Now if you were an Old Testament believer and you went to go visit the temple one day or you went on an outing to take your children or uh, you were bored in the holiday so you decided to go to Jerusalem and visit the temple, the one thing that you will not find in the temple complex is a bench or a chair. You, the priests could never sit down. They were continually standing. And this was very symbolic because their work was never done so God never allowed them to sit. There was always another sacrifice. There was always something else to be done. There was always more work. They could never sit down. Listen to again, listen again to what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. It says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So there in the whole history of the world is the first priest who ever sat down uh, after his work. Jesus sat down. The great priestly work of making a suitable, sufficient sacrifice was completed. It was done. It was finalized. It was over. And so this priest could sit down because the sacrifice was sufficient. They didn't have to make any more sacrifices. They didn't have to kill any more animals because a single sacrifice for the sins of all God's people had been made. And that's why, by the way, in our family of churches, we don't have altars when we serve communion. We have tables because you sacrifice at altars. But Christ has been sacrificed. So you'll never find an altar in our church. You'll only find a table because what do you do at a table? Well, you eat food. And that's what we do. We eat the bread and we drink the grape juice to remember that Christ's single, of, single sacrifice of himself for all time. And also when we celebrate communion, we celebrate communion. We don't celebrate mass. We don't, in some kind of a mysterious way, seek to represent or, re, or remake the sacrifice of Christ on behalf of sinners. No. 
The great sacrifice has been made once for all. The great high priest has sat down. So now we just serve communion where we remember afresh that Jesus died for us and we pray for him to strengthen us in our walk with the Lord. Listen to what Hebrews 10 verse 11 onwards says. It says, And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. You know, all those sacrifices for all those years could never take away sins. No matter how many bulls or goats you kill, they could never take away sins. How can a bull take away sin? But they simply pointed us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ who was the final sacrifice. Verse 12, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God he sat down dear friends the great priestly work to which all those bulls and lambs and goats and liters of blood flowed all that pointed forward to the great priest who would one day make a great offering and sit down because the work to make us acceptable to God each one of us the work to make us acceptable to God has been done So Jesus sat down. Secondly, Jesus is our final and ultimate high priest because Jesus was tempted and yet without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 14 onwards. It says this. Since then we have a great high priest. Notice it says a great high priest. He surpasses all the other priests of the Old Testament. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. And this of course refers to Jesus Ascension to heaven. We pass through the heavens. His exaltation, his glorification, he didn't stay on earth, no. He ascended through the heavens to be with God when he sat down at the right hand. Jesus, the very Son of God, in other words, he's not just a, a mere human being, no, he's the very Son of God, so he can pay for the sins of all God's people. Since then, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who every, in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. If Jesus had sinned just one time, just one time offended God or rebelled against God, then his death would only be sufficient for his own sin. But because he never sinned, his death was sufficient for the sins of others. And because he was the Son of God, his death was sufficient for the sins of all God's people. So he's our ultimate high priest because he never sinned. Thirdly, Jesus is our final and ultimate high priest because he was appointed by God. You know, Jesus wasn't just some self-styled prophet or some spiritual guru who thought too highly of himself and somehow history has made too much of him. No, Jesus was appointed by God himself. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 5. For every high priest, talking about the Old Testament, chosen from among men, is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with ignorance and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor on for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron, the first priest, was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said, You are my son, today I have begotten you. See, although Jesus was the great second person of the Trinity, God the Son himself, he didn't appoint himself to be high priest. He didn't think too highly of himself. No, he was appointed by God to be priest. And Jesus, once appointed, went through to the end to death for us to make that one offering of himself. Jesus was appointed by God. You know, some people write books about Jesus today and their thesis is that Jesus was, you know, was a good prophet. He said many good things like love your neighbors and uh, give to Caesar what he Caesar's. But then the rest of the New Testament authors made too much of Jesus. Jesus never intended to be called the Son of God. He never intended to be worshipped all over the world. People have made too much about Jesus. He was just a simple prophet and lived a simple life and we should all just live simple lives like Jesus. But no! That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he was appointed by God himself to be the great high priest who would make a single offering of himself for the sins of the people. Appointed by God. And fourthly, why Jesus is our final and ultimate high priest is because he offered himself 
Listen to what Hebrews 7 says from verse 26. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of others. Uh, since he did this once for all, when he offered up himself. Himself. See, the interesting thing in the New Testament is, Jesus is not only our high priest, but he's also our sacrifice. He's the high priest who offers himself as a sacrifice. Remember what John the Baptist said when he saw the, Jesus for the first time? He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the whole Old Testament priesthood points to Jesus, our great high priest. And the whole Old Testament sacrificial, sin, uh, sacrificial system with all the unblemished goats, untainted lambs, they all point us to Jesus, our final sacrifice, the sinless Son of God who dies for our sin. Why did Jesus have to offer himself? Well, Hebrews 10 tells us. Listen to what it says in, from verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. In other words, the law, the Old Testament, is just a shadow. The reality is in Christ. It can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Killing of goats can't forgive your sin. Climbing a mountain and meditating before God can't forgive your sin. All those things, merely human things can't take away sin. The Old Testament just pointed us to Christ. But then it says, otherwise, uh, they, otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But Verse 3, But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible by the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's not possible for religious observance to take away sins. It's not possible for any other philosophy or worldview or lifestyle to take away sins. It's not possible for any religious system to take away sins. Only Christ's death as sacrificed and high priest can do it. So the whole sacrificial system reminds us that sin is serious and, de and sin deserves death and it points us to a saviour, Christ the Lord Jesus who offered up himself for sin and then lastly Jesus is our final and ultimate high priest because he makes us perfect before God listen to the encouraging words of Hebrews 10 verse 14 it says for by a single offering he has perfected for all he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified See, by Jesus' one single offering of himself, through his death and through trust in him, we can be perfected for how long? For all time. By a single offering, we are perfected for all time. So if we had to die tonight, we know that we will be with God. Because we have been perfected, our sin has been removed. If we have to die next month, we will know that we will be with God because we have been perfected for all time. This is the doctrine of justification. That when we put our trust in Christ, all our sins, past, present and future, has been forgiven. And God does not see our fallenness, but God sees Christ's righteousness when he looks at us. So as Christians, dear friends, this might have been a rough year. You might have wallowed in sin. You might have had good times, you might have had bad times. But do you know this? As a Christian, by Christ's single offering of himself, you have been perfected in God's sight for all time. And what is the earthly outcome of that perf being made perfect for all time? Well, look at the, what it says, those who are being sanctified. Being sanctified being, means being made holy. So we are perfected before God and the sign of that in our lives on earth is that we are being made more and more holy. We are saying, we are saying, no, more often to sin. We are sinning less and less and less. We are being more, made more holy. That perfection is being seen more and more in our lives here on earth. We are not perfect, but we are progressing as Christians. See, what is the sign? How do you know that you have been perfected by Jesus? How do you know 
that you are a Christian? What is the evidence in your life? Well, you are growing in your holiness. You are being sanctified. See, Jesus makes us perfect before God. Jesus does for us what nothing else or no other religious system can do. It makes us acceptable to God by His one offering of Himself. Let me just list a few implications of that for our lives. The first implication of that is, of course, draw near to God. If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, it says in verse 22, Let us draw near with a full with, with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That just simply says, if through trust in Christ, your consciences can be cleansed, your evil deeds can be cleansed, then you can be freed and set free. Why would you not draw near to God? So maybe, dear friend, you are not a Christian here this morning. You haven't put your trust in Christ. Know that he is the one, single off, the one single way you can be made right with God. And he has done it for you. And the Bible commends you, commands you to draw near to him in full assurance of faith because he's done it for you. Second implication is keep trusting Jesus. Verse 23 says, let us hold fast, talking about Christians, let us Christians hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Now these Christians back in the days of, of the book of Hebrews, they were in danger of forsaking Christ and going back to their old Jewish religious worldview and system and beliefs. They were in danger of rejecting Jesus and moving on. And the writer to the Hebrews says, Dear friends, don't lose heart. Don't move away from Jesus. Keep trusting Jesus because it's only through Jesus that you can be made acceptable to God. There is a new religion in the world today. It's called tolerance. And of course tolerance is good. But just because you tolerate a different view doesn't mean that you have to agree with that view. And this new religion says as long as you love others and acknowledge God and care for the needy, you're okay. That's what God requires, they say. So sin is downgraded into intolerance. God is downgraded to your concept of God. And love is downgraded to agreeing with others' personal lifestyle choices. This is the new religion of our world. And the writer says, are you going to hold to this religion? Are you going to move to this new religion of so-called tolerance? Or are you going to keep trusting Jesus to make you acceptable to God so that on the last day, on the great day of judgment, you can stand before God as perfect? As, as Frank Retief said in a sermon at, uh, at uh, my uncle's funeral a few weeks ago, he said, if you die as a Christian, you will be saved. And thirdly, encourage one another in Christian living. Hebrews 10 verse 24, and let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works. See, the, as Christians, we encourage one another. We encourage one another not to make us acceptable to God, but because we are acceptable to God, we encourage one another. Because of Christ's finished work on the cross, because all our sins have been paid for, because we are now perfect in God's sight, we encourage other Christians and we say, Dear brother, how are you doing? Dear sister, are you walking with the Lord? Are you trusting Jesus? See, love and good deeds is just a summary of the Christian life. How's your walk with the Lord going? Are you, are you serving in ministry? What can I do to help you? Not that we have anything great to share, but because of Christ's finished work. That is the basis of our encouragement to other Christians. And maybe in this year ahead, uh, we can focus on one or two people especially and see how we can encourage them, not to make themselves acceptable to God in some way, but because they are acceptable to God through Christ's sacrifice, to encourage them in their walk. Another implication is that we keep meeting together. Hebrews 10.25 says, not, ne not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. See, the Bible says there's no such thing as solitary Christianity, but because Christ is our single sacrifice and has made us perfect before God, we need to meet together regularly to encourage one another. A coal, if you take a coal away from the fire, that coal burns out and dies. 
Keep the coals all together. Keep encouraging one another on the basis of Christ's finished work. And so I, for this next year, I encourage you to, to be regular in your church attendance, in your Bible study attendance, in your, at the men's breakfast and ladies' breakfast. Let's keep meeting so we can encourage one another as the day approaches because of Christ's finished work for us. And lastly, and this is where I end, stop sinning. The impl- another implication of the finished work of Christ is that we need to stop sinning as much as we can. Listen to what Hebrews 10.26 says. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversary. Now this passage, dear friends, is referring to Christians or professing Christians who have turned from the church, they've rejected the truth and they've forsaken Christ and they are now living in deliberate, constant sin. Their lifestyle is a sinful lifestyle. And the Bible says there is no sacrifice for them because why? Because they've rejected Jesus who is our sacrifice. So there can be no sacrifice for them, only judgment to come. Now this passage is not referring to backsliders. We all go through times in our lives where we've we walk a little bit further from the Lord where we should and uh, there is sin involved. This passage is not talking about this. This passage is talking about those who reject Christ and live in deliberate sin, although they know the truth. Because the sign of a Christian is that even though he backslides and lives in sin for a while, he will always repent and return to God because God keeps them. You see, if Christ has paid the price to set us free from sin's dungeon, How can we go back and live in that dungeon? And a Christian will never go back and live in that dungeon. We may go walk closely to that dungeon, we may peer inside and look, but then we'll realize by God's grace that what sin is, and we'll repent and we'll return to God. We have been set free from the dungeon of sin. Christ has freed us. We will never return to live in that dungeon. So the Bible says, the writer of Hebrews commends us to be careful how we live. If Christ has set you free from sin's dungeon, don't dabble with sin and mess around with the dungeon. You could be in danger. So dear friends, in this, in this next year, 2014, will you draw near to God, if you haven't already? Will you keep trusting Jesus, who is our final sacrifice and high priest? Would you encourage one another, someone in particular, in their walk with the Lord? Will you keep meeting together regularly? And will you stop sinning? And will I stop sinning as best we can and stay as far away from that dungeon as we can because of Christ's final work for us on the cross that makes us acceptable to God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for our Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest who has died and rose again, who has paid the price of his own life to make us acceptable for all time to you. Thank you that we can know that if we die as Christians, we will be with you and each other forever. Oh Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, how grateful we are. Oh Lord, would you help us to draw near? Would you help us to encourage other brothers and sisters in their walk with you? Would you keep us faithful and would you keep us from sin? If you have died for sin, if you have freed us from the dungeon of sin, How can we go back? Oh Lord, give us a hatred of sin. Give us a love for those things that honour you. Thank you that when we do sin, we know that you have an advocate with the Father. Thank you that you have paid the price for all our sin. Keep us repenting of sin quickly and keep us walking close to you, we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing out quickly and keep us walking close to you, we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our quickly and keep us walking close to you, we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our quickly and keep us walking.